Hi everyone, this is Health Aid Chats. So I'm the co-founder, um, Barry, uh, and CEO of Health Aid. Um, so we aim to democratize uh, verified health expert information online um, related to preventative health and performance optimization. So we're very lucky today to have Dr. David Cunnington. Um, he's a sleep doctor from Melbourne with extensive experience and training in this area. Welcome. Thanks, Barry. Yeah. So, um, yeah, tell us a bit about your background, how you got into sleep. Why didn't you end up in another specialty? Sure. So I trained originally as a respiratory physician in Australia. And part of that training, you get exposure to sleep apnea and trouble with breathing during sleep. And then following that training, I went and spent a couple of years, um, very fortunately, at Harvard in the US as part of their sleep group doing research into sleep, but also participating in all the different clinical aspects and other educational aspects at Harvard around sleep, which is really broad. And that really opened my eyes to the, the broad aspects of sleep, got hooked on that. And so that was about 20 years ago. And so really I've been practicing as a sleep physician ever since. One of the things I love about sleep medicine is that it's broad. It encompasses pretty much all areas of health and not just the areas of health where, you know, we're seeing it in a hospital setting or in a specialist practice, but health in the broader community and our general health and our everyday health, sleep's a really important part of that. But it fits with my sort of personal approach. I really like to take a pretty broad approach and look at uh, lifestyle factors, psychologically based factors, social factors that might be impacting on health and sleep. And yeah, sleep really lends itself to that approach. Great. So would you consider it being a relatively new profession? Yeah, absolutely. So sleep medicine, we first started to be able to measure sleep using uh, electrical signals like EEG, electroencephalography, in the sort of late 1930s, not into the 1940s. So really not much was known about sleep until then. It was thought it was a time when the body, the brain just went quiet. So nothing bad should happen because everything just turns off during sleep. But really with that better ability to measure the physiology of sleep, but really became evident that sleep's actually a time brain body are quite active. There's a lot going on during sleep. And when there's a lot going on, there are things that can not go right. And so now we've got a much better understanding at a biological and physiological level, what's actually going on with sleep, which is important because that's that from myself as a physician, how I approach managing people's sleep problems, understand the physiology, understand the biology, bring that to our clinical approach rather than sleep. It's this just generic black box. And unfortunately, as we'll get into a lot of the education stuff around sleep or advice around sleep is just, okay, sleep's this black box. You don't sleep good. You must do these generic instructions. It ain't like that. Everyone's sleep problem is different and they have different physiology that they bring to it. The biology underlying it is quite different. So understanding that's really important to be able to tailor approaches to different individuals. Great. So, um, yeah, I'm going to fire some many questions that I hear in the go media. For, go for it. From uh, so-called experts around the world, around this area. Um, my first question is uh, if you, problems, right? So we're talking about preventative health and just performance optimization. I'm not going to go into disease today, even though it's important. It's probably the bulk of what you deal with as a sleep physician. Mm -hmm. But I'd say if you don't get enough sleep in the short term, is there, you know, risks or effects on that? on your general health or chronic disease, or uh, when we talk about from a long-term sleep deprivation perspective? Yeah, so there's a couple of ways of thinking about that. So short answer is yes, but I really do want to divide it up. Think of the world as being divided into people who are trying to cheat sleep and push sleep to the corners. And then there's the people who are trying to, trying to get sleep, but it's just not happening. So think of that as insomnia. So someone who sets aside enough time for sleep, the appropriate opportunity for sleep, but just can't get to sleep or wakes during the night. Now, the important thing in that group, the data is not as strong that it has those negative effects. And in fact, what might cause the negative effects in that group is being distressed about not sleeping. The data is actually much stronger in the group who are trying to cheat sleep. I'm just trying to push sleep to the corner. I'm going to just trade off as much sleep as I possibly can because eyes open, i got things to do. You know, that rise and grind type of thinking. So yeah, definitely research showing that that sort of approach and being chronically partially sleep deprived, so meaning chronically underslept, yeah, is associated with lots of things, increased risk of anxiety, increased risk of depression, hypertension, other cardiovascular 
diseases. Um, and in the longer run, we do wonder about some of the neurodegenerative disorders as well, so like dementias. The data around that's not quite a, um, sort of solid as yet, but we do think that people who are chronically underslept by cheating sleep have those sort of long-term risks. And then it's got the short-term risk. If you look at the cognitive aspects, so you might be cheating sleep, but there's really good research amongst leaders and managers looking at decision-making and actually showing that people make poor decisions. They think they're making good decisions because they're on that right. I'm killing this. I'm absolutely on the go. But the actual decisions they make are not as well thought through, not as well reasoned because executive functioning is impaired in the setting of sleep deprivation. Really good research showing that people are not as respected as much by their underlings or employees, and their employees have less moral behaviour whilst under the supervision of a sleep-deprived leader. Oh, wow. And so there's all sorts of sort of leadership, sort of managerial things that don't go well if you're both not sleeping well yourself and you're setting an example of that for people who work under you, it's all going to go badly for you. Oh, well, wow. so have you seen that in actual practice? Too? All the time. All the time. Wow. So you're right. People come and see me in my day job as a physician, you know, as a specialist sleep physician, you know, I'm seeing people with sleep disorders who are pretty unwell. So people end up in my office when the wheels fall off. They've really been pushing it too hard for too long and have some sort of breakdown and really get into a difficult situation. So I'll absolutely see that sort of end result of that. But then when I question them and go back, they, you can really see that for four or five years preceding that, their business wasn't going so great. There was a lot of churn. There was sort of poor output. You know, you could really see the writing was on the wall and it's only that it's gone that far they ended up in my office. Much better to take a preventative approach and recognise, you know, okay, early on, five years ago, things weren't going so great. Maybe if I change my approach around sleep and aren't pushing it to the corner so much, I may not have ended up in this situation in the first place. Yeah, so um, I'm going to give an example. Um, so of a world leader, uh, Elon Musk. So he kind of brags sometimes about how little sleep he gets, right? Like four or five hours. And then I think Ariana Huffington <laughs> said he's crazy or something like that. Yeah. Um, and he, he does tweet some strange things, which is right. like in trouble and he's going yeah. to be on Twitter. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, this, this last week, there's that interesting tweet comment he had about um, Adderall being good. So a variant of amphetamines being good and Wellbutrin or an SNRI bupropion being bad. And I'm, so, I'm sort of looking at that going, yeah, okay, so you sleep four or five hours at night and you're saying amphetamines are good. Could there be a connection between, between these things? So that's where that leadership judgment decision-making research comes in because it's very much along those lines, people who will brag that they sleep a short amount of period of time, they think they're getting things done in a task orientated way, they might be ticking off lots of things, but the research really clearly shows that the decisions that they make are not actually as well thought through or good strategic decisions. Interesting. So would you say if he slept more, he might even be a better CEO? Absolutely. Absolutely. I have an interesting example. I was you know, I do lots of talks for various um, employee groups. And I once spoke for a large company and the, the CEO gave me the brief. It goes, no, whatever you do, just don't tell people they need to sleep more. We work hard here. You know, we do think, you know, it's a company that makes big financial transactions. And I was trying to tell him, you know what, you want your people to make better decisions when they're making big financial transactions, let them rest a bit more. Don't push them so hard. Because it's just that very much that rise and grind sort of philosophy. The, the more hours we put into something, the better we're going to do. Well, it doesn't hold necessarily. And the research doesn't support that. Interesting. So if you had a consultation with Elon, how would you convince him in a consult as a doctor? Um, how to say, Elon, you need to sleep, you know, more than <laughs> five hours. Like you're trying to argue with his points on tweet. What would you say as a doctor? Yeah, I know. I tried to... Yourself <laughs> yeah, and him. As both humans, yeah, what would not, you say? not expecting to have a lot of success, but I'd certainly be pointing out the fact that as human beings, we need a mix of doing things plus also rest and recovery. And certainly, you know, twenty first century, the focus is very much gone away from the value of rest and recovery in what we do, and sleep is one of those things. So it doesn't. I wouldn't necessarily say like Elon, you must sleep more but you must have more time off task, more downtime. Because again, if you take 
the premise, if we're in good physical and mental health, rest recovery is still something that we need. And if we allocate the appropriate amount of time for that, and we can debate what the time is, but let's just say it's eight hours and that's not, I'm not fixed on that. And you say, you know what? I just need eight hours of downtime per 24 hours and my body will take the mix it needs. If it needs six hours of sleep and two hours of rest or seven hours of sleep and one hour of rest or whatever ratio, it'll sort that out. My body will self-regulate and sort that out. My responsibility is to give it the opportunity to self-regulate, not try and force that self-regulation into, into the corner and say, you know what? You need eight hours of downtime. I'm only going to give you four. Do your best with four because it, it won't work. So can you catch up on sleep? So can you have three all-nighters, like as a student, for example, and then on the weekend, sleeping? So so yes and no, right? So this concept of sleep debt is absolutely a concept. So we have this intrinsic self-regulatory process. So if we're awake for a certain amount of time, there's a certain amount of sleep we need to pay back to restore us from that period of wakefulness. Sleep debt's the best type of debt. You don't have to pay it back in a one-to-one ratio. So you, you had that example of, you know, pull three all-nighters as a student. You don't have to sleep three days by 24 hours to pay that back. Often you'll find you have one a bit longer night sleep and you're like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm done. I've, I've paid back that debt. So it's not been paid back in a one-to-one ratio. So yes, so you can pay back that sleep debt. Having said that though, there's also research showing this sort of um, social jet lag, yo-yo sleeping and some of the terms of, I'm going to undersleep through the week and try and catch up on the weekends. That really doesn't work because people who follow that type of pattern never fully catch up on the weekends because they'll catch up a little bit. They'll just, but if you a really nice study looking at people over three weeks looking at their performance on a Monday morning, showing that there's a decrement on the, after one week, further decrement after two weeks, further decrement after three weeks of following that sort of undersleep during the week, try and catch up on the weekends type of sleep pattern. And would you say it's a fallacy that they're going to get more done? Like talking about that three all-nighters, that if they don't sleep, they're going to you know, revise more of what they have to do for the exam, for example. Yeah, so I've got to think about the task at hand. So you know, in years gone by, the task at hand might have been punching widgets. So you know, totally no cognitive input. I'm just here punching widgets. So sure, you might punch more widgets if you have more time allocated to it, but studying for an exam, the sort of entrepreneurial type work people might do, running your own business, producing content, professional services sort of work, that ain't punching widgets. It's about decision-making, quality of output, judgment, strategy, retention, memory. You know, it's all of those things. And so that model of, I'm just going to punch more widgets, it doesn't work for that type of work because it's a totally different task that has totally different requirements. Right. So you're talking more about like the knowledge worker probably has yeah. to just critically think. Uh, Absolutely. A programmer, for example, who needs to, you know, remember all these lines of things and code and algorithms, even, I don't know, maybe, maybe we can go to a, a sports person who, who needs to focus really yeah, absolutely. But that's we can actually learn a bit from the sports area. So, so it's really interesting. I see a lot of um, elite athletes um, with trouble with sleep. You know, they're perfectionists, so they've got an increased risk of getting sleep problems, getting anxious about sleep, and they're trying for the one percenters to just get that advantage. But what we can learn from athletes is they will prioritise rest. They absolutely know if I overtrain, I'm not going to perform well. So an athlete, if you look at an athlete's training schedule, a professional athlete, it's got perform, it's got rest and recovery in it. If you look at someone who would see themselves as a leader in the business world, it does not have, I'm going to perform and I'm going to rest and recover. It just has, I am going to be on sort of all the time. My eyes are open, I am going to be on. And they're much higher risk of that sort of burning out. Now, the athletes get trouble with insomnia because they just get this, the coaches tell them, unless you sleep for eight hours, you're not going to recover and your opponent's going to beat you, which makes them anxious about sleep. But in terms of the rest and recovery, I think in the business world or the knowledge worker world, we really need to learn that from athletes as human beings. We need that rest and recovery. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very interesting point. Um, so if we look towards the future, it's looking like the world's becoming more um, knowledge work. Than Absolutely. Punching holes, as you said, um, because that will probably be done by robots or automation and AI. So that's where the sleep physician probably will have more work, more and more work. And um, so these things need to be recognised now, I think, to you know, bring to your kids and teach other people about that. And often we, yeah, we see these leaders sleeping little and we follow their tracks because we, we think that's the only way you can succeed. And um, I think that, needs, that, that kind of myth yeah. needs to be broken down before you get sick. And Yeah, and particularly in the business owner, entrepreneurial sort of world, there's that culture of just, yeah, work harder, work longer. You know, I'm a big fan of Gary V and, you know, what he's taught people yep. about content marketing yep but i remember one of these sort of memes was you know i'm working while you're sleeping you know that's sort of one of the messages and that's a very strong cultural type of message in that group and i think some surgeons are like that too or medical specialists that don't sleep much and they're just working literally 80 hours weeks too uh, yeah absolutely as a medical profession we're probably worse than a lot of other industries and arguably, unlike other fatigue-sensitive industries like pilots, transport drivers, the medical profession isn't regulated in terms of hours. So there's no one saying, you've done your 40 hours, right, where's your logbook? You're, you're done for the week. You need to go home and rest. You know, as me as a medical specialist, if I said, right, I'm going to start at seven, I'm going to see patients till midnight every day, no one's going to stop me. Yeah, I mean, I think my wife had that situation where she's like, this person's going to operate on me in the middle of the night. Has he had enough sleep? How, how do you know that the, his precision and decision making at that time is accurate? Well, um, in, in fact, in fact, you know it's not. There's been some nice real world studies of medical practitioners, including surgeons, showing that once they're operating out of hours, there's an increased risk of um, poor outcomes. In essence, so if your surgeon wants to schedule a surgery for late at night. Yeah, so how about we book, book it during the day? It's a very good tip. <laughs> Great. So, um, yeah, so overall, can you actually cheat sleep or hack your way through it in any way? And can you measure it as a, as a public member without, you know, whacking on electrodes and sleep studies? Yeah. You? So then can, can we cheat sleep? The answer, the answer is no. That, that's really the straightforward answer. So can you really, the way I would try and think about it is how the body regulates sleep is pretty simple. There's a couple of pretty simple principles around sleep. So there's the body clock, there's this accumulation of sleep drive and, and sleep need. So really, and then there's, um, there's also our personal sleep preferences. For me, it's having an understanding of that for yourself as an individual. What, when does sleep work best for you? When's your performance optimal for you? What sort of sleeping pattern suits better for you? You know, understanding those things and working with it rather than trying to just fight against it and say, you know what, that's what you want to do, body. I'm going to just totally ignore that and I'm just going to say, you've got to do that. So really trying to, uh, what I'm trying to say, use sleep as a tool to um, work with it, understand your own sleep patterns rather than trying to life hack it to get to minimize how much that you need. So do you have any tips for the, you know, the person who's not trained medically or in the scientific approach when they, for example, watch a, a TED talk with millions yeah. of views and heaps of likes? Or another example is just, you know, a YouTube clip where this you know, potentially respectable person comes up and talks about sleep tips with great comments on the YouTube. Does that necessarily mean it's good information that they should take? Are there any tips for you from you around you can share how, how they can critically appraise the content to make them beneficial and meaningful to themselves or discuss? Yeah, so, yeah, particularly in sleep, it's really challenging because everyone's got an opinion about sleep. <laughs> One of the things I both love and find tricky practicing in this area, you know, if you get a lung cancer, you don't ask your neighbor how they should treat your lung cancer. You go and see the lung cancer specialist. But if you're not sleeping well, the person over the fence will go, well, maybe you should be doing this or you should try. Everyone's got an opinion about sleep. And so a lot of the information is very generic. It's actually based on myths. It's based on sort of motherhood statements. 
rather than being very science based. So really, if, um, people are sort of looking for, well, how do you work out what's good advice and what's not good advice? A good starting point is most countries, and in fact, around the world, there's a range of different professional bodies um, of both sleep specialists, as well as foundations that sort of work along the sleep specialists for putting out good content information about sleep. So in Australia, for example, we've got the Sleep Health Foundation that has really good information about sleep because it's one of the gaps it and really a need, you know, I've got my own website with good information about sleep, sleephub.com.au, and really develop that because of this sense of there's a whole lot of information that's not necessarily of good quality, wanting to provide a good quality sort of evidence-based resource and sort of put that out there for people to be able to access. So right. yeah, prof professional bodies is, a, is also a, a, a good start. And, and even it gets tricky because even credentialed people who may be university based, maybe the university job is very laboratory based, working with animals, test tubes, yep. you know, pe people who don't have sleep disorders, but they'll generalize that and they, they don't actually work with patients. They're not used to working with people to know how to actually implement things with people. So it can give very sort of generic type of advice. Yeah, um, that's an interesting point. Um, so there's a lot of things that come out in the media that go nuts around like lab studies, you know, around mice and whatever. And there's like promising results in this and promising results in that. What's your thoughts about people experimenting with yeah. the results of that? Or do you think they should stay away from it? Do they need to, you know, weigh up the risks of that? Do they need to speak to the doctor? What's, I mean, there's a lot of stuff everywhere now because the world is connected um, yeah. on the internet. So what's yeah, so, and that's exactly right. And that's often the media sort of cycle is we'll find something in an animal model and, it, you know, the, the you don't sleep, you'll get dementia story is a really nice example of that. So there was an animal model where animals were sleep deprived for a short period of time and accumulated a bit more beta amyloid protein in the brain, one of the proteins associated with Alzheimer's. And that just translates to you don't sleep, you're going to get dementia. Now, there's many, many steps between an experimental animal model and humans living in the wild over many years, um, maybe not sleeping as much as they wish. And a lot of those steps is adaptation. Human beings are actually pretty good at adapting to different circumstances. And so that sort of experiment doesn't actually take into account any of the effect of adaptation or any of the fact that maybe the short sleep we see in humans has got other factors contributing to it, which might actually mediate some of that relationship. So yeah, so in the UK, there's a story that came out in the media about yeah, you don't sleep, you're going to get Alzheimer's. And one of their leading evidence-based bodies in medicine, so the NICE consortium, had to put out a press release really saying, let's not make you know one plus one equals 10 to come to this type yeah. of conclusion to tone down some of that. Because that ends up in my practice. Someone who's already having trouble sleeping reads that headline, I'm not sleeping, I'm going to get dementia. And it just makes them more anxious and even more trouble sleeping. So yeah. it actually exacerbates the problem. So, so what do you do when someone comes in and goes, oh, there's this Harvard study, right, that was released yesterday around this. What's your process in... Yeah, so part of it's looking at what the actual study shows. Right. And you, usually there is that problem of it's a stretch to get to that sort of conclusion and really trying to reassure them that the, the situation for them in particular is not necessarily, um, the article's not necessarily relevant to them. And even if it is relevant to them, usually then looking at them as an individual and saying, okay, well, what are some factors we can look at for you that may be either of getting in the way of sleep or opportunities to improve their sleep so that there's not that same level of risk or level of concern. Great. So finally, um, what would the three key tips you give or share to everyone on how to optimize your sleep? That's probably not commonly known when you Google it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so probably as I've alluded to, the key one for me is respect sleep. So recognize we just got to provide an adequate opportunity for sleep. And then the second part, which is a bit more subtle, is then don't worry so much about what happens in that space. Just see rest, sleep, recovery, all those things that we need. And so step one, make sure we respect it, allocate the space. Step two, 
then step back a bit and go, you know what? I'm in good physical and mental health. My body will put into that space whatever it needs of that mix of rest, recovery, sleep. So I don't need to be too concerned about that. And then number three really would be, again, a bit subtle, is don't go too hard on the bullet points or the lists of things. Because for a lot of people, the trouble with sleep is they try too hard around sleep. They're very task orientated around it. That's a guaranteed way not to make you sleep. And so we're used to in our day being very task orientated. Where's the problem? How do I make it better? What's the steps I'm going to put into place? We take that approach to sleep and we're like, oh, there's the thing. I haven't done that thing. That's why I'm not sleeping. And you add more rules to your list. For me to sleep, I've got to do this and this and this. And if I don't do that, then I won't be able to do this. There, that actually becomes part of the problem. So rather than looking for more things, trying to almost look outside it. Well, what other factors may be going on in life that may be impacting on sleep? Yeah. Um, and a question there. Um, so your local GP, do they know enough about sleep to provide this type of advice? So, so not that more nuanced advice, but the real value of a GP is that they know you and they know you over a period of time. And a lot of the time, stuff that's going on with sleep, funnily enough, ain't about sleep. Sleep's just a barometer of physical and mental health. So sleep's gone off. It's okay. Something else has changed. Lifestyle, physical health, mental health. That's where your GP is an expert in being able to know you over time and be able to see, okay, well, this has changed. and Maybe that's what's driving the sleep problem. So that's why the GP is a great starting point to be able to look at what else is going on with life and health which may actually be having flow-on effects for sleep. Great. And um, with your Sleep Hub website, what would our audience find on there when they visit? Yeah, so for me, it's uh, you know, strong sort of content marketing. So by that, I mean lots of content that's evidence-based about sleep. So there's written content in terms of website, blog posts, uh, there's a podcast series, uh, lots of videos. We have a YouTube channel associated with it. So lots of just good quality information about sleep. And how often do you update that? Yeah, so we're putting new posts up usually weekly, podcasts around monthly, uh, and reasonably active on social media. Again, the pandemic's been pretty crazy. Lots of people not sleeping well because of COVID and the after effects of COVID and, and everything. But yeah, usually we're pretty active on social media as well. On that point, um, does COVID... Uh, does sleep manage long COVID at all? No. So we think poor sleep is one of the symptoms of long COVID, but then deliberately, say, putting someone on a sedative or trying to manipulate sleep doesn't translate to helping the fatigue symptoms during the day. Oh, right. But there's, there's fatigue during the day, but that's not a function of sleep quality necessarily. All right. Thanks for your time. That was fantastic. Um, do you have any questions about um, anything related to health aid? That yeah. So if people are looking for other things on health aid, what should they expect to be able to find? Yeah. So at the moment, we we're focused more on uh, preventive health and performance optimization. We're we're looking at health experts that are verified and generally practicing. Um, we're also hoping to build it up to the point where there will be exclusive content there that's not available anywhere else, where um, patients can visit there, recommend by their doctors to purchase certain courses and programs, digital programs that just add another service to remote care outside of the, the consultation room. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully over time, we'll, we'll build that database and it'll become more trusted than places like YouTube or some, some of the other areas. And um, we, we hope that doctors will increasingly trust this place, uh, mm -hmm. that we've, we've done our due, due diligence on people, that we make sure they're verified and the, the information there is relevant and current and evidence-based. So that's that's basically yeah, a great. Thank you. No worries. Thanks, right. Barry. No worries. Thank you.